Hello, everybody. Here we are. We are live. Christian Jack alongside Charlie O'Connor Clark. Happy Thursday evening. Red Thursday evening show for us. It has been that kind of week. Uh, what a week indeed it has been. Uh, yeah. Charlie, how's it going, man? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's been a good week. <laughs> really good week for Canada soccer, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, welcome all. Uh, welcome on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter as well. Uh, stick around. We're going to be with you for probably around 90 minutes as we get set for uh, another big weekend as well in the Canadian Premier League as we get set for the Premier League uh, semifinals. Uh, we've got four great guests on shortly, but we, of course, will talk about Canada soccer. There is a chat box. Please put any of your thoughts, comments, questions, predictions for this weekend as well. And stick around later in the show. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving you a nice prize that's right i uh a free subscription <laughs> or whatever whatever you call it what do you call it Charlie? A copy a copy. copy copy that's right a football manager 2022 uh which you can play with the canadian premier league teams and if you've not seen it benedict rose has done a great job of recapping i love these pieces that benedict writes charlie on yeah. our website just recapping some of the brilliant stuff on the on football manager 2022 that's right we'll be announcing that uh for one lucky winner at the end of the show so stick around and we'll get to that S uh, certainly very soon hello to vincenzo jeffrey patrick uh sunny uh, everybody out there as well uh the rundown for today is as follows we're going to talk some canada first we're going to be joined by former canadian international and a massive fan of the game in this country manny apiricio as his pacific gets set to fly into calgary tomorrow to take on familiar foes Cavalry FC. Their boss is indeed Tommy Wilden Jr. He'll be joining us probably around 10 after the hour uh, and he'll be obviously giving the Calgary side of things from that side of things with Cavalry FC. And then later in the show, we'll be joined by Kwame Iwur, one of the best guys and one of the best players in the, in the Canadian Premier League. He'll join us from Forge at 7.30, followed by Gus McNabb, the main man in charge at York United. Armin says he got sacked in Football <laughs> Manager 2022, but it, to be fair, I did only sign goalkeepers, so that was not wise. Armin, I know you're way smarter than that. So <laughs> I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I could see him doing that, though. You can see fair. him doing that? Yeah. yeah. I, I got asked yesterday in my uh, rare Q&A Q on Twitter, about chat, uh, football manager and um, not, I, you know, I've been playing championship manager 97, 98. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's the elite game of all, anybody who knows about it. And uh, I started a game with Runcorn who just got promoted to division three with no players and no money. So I've just started oh. that recently. Uh, although I'd realized when I loaned a lot of goalkeepers out that when I got drawn against Manchester United in the cup, they couldn't play. So my left back went in goal and we got beat 6 0. So a little bit the opposite to you then, Armin. So <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good result anyway, losing 6 0 without a goal. It could be worse. It could it be could a be lot be worse. Well, worse. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, how's things? Great recap this week on campl.ca. On camp we were all over it. I was in Edmonton as well. Uh, we're going to get to some people talking about that very soon on here as well. But how do you uh, how do you look back in this? I know you did a great job writing a few features on the site for it as well. Yeah, I uh, I still don't really believe that it all happened, right? <laughs> right? I mean, especially just for me, I I wasn't in Edmonton. I was sitting here warm on my couch, uh, and it felt kind of like a like a fever dream. Like even I think about it now, it just the whole the energy that came through the TV for those two games against Costa Rica and Mexico, just the whole event of it, and you know the significance just feels still feels like it's not real <laughs> yeah no i think that's a really good way of putting it and that's okay to admit right because yeah i mean you're, you're i mean i think well you, i know this you did a great job encapsulating the the issues that being a canadian soccer fan for a long time <laughs> is there right you talked about it in your piece the atiba no goal all the issues with eight one way back in that yeah and you're pretty young by the mm -hmm. way and you still got scars <laughs> right you still this is what i'm saying is that oh, yeah. th there's been scars recently uh, uh, you know so look we're going to get to a point where you know teenagers and and children you know my son's age hopefully won't have so many scars if this is the start of something right but for you know i guess you know for right now what's happening is it, it is very unreal it's very difficult to understand and, and believe it that it's happening and um you know that was certainly the impression that i got we did a voyages night in edmonton with the great friends at one soccer on monday night that was just brilliant to hear and see um and they uh they were terrific you know and they had a lot of optimism going into the game but they were saying the same thing you know is that there's been so much fear with them in, yeah. in the past and that maybe fear is the wrong word but something about that at least in terms of wondering what was happening as well so hello to Saeed, hello to ryan uh get your comments in hello to conrad our friend the foot shoulder hooligan as he calls himself uh but yeah we know you conrad you're not gonna hurt anybody's feelings or anybody <laughs> there so uh but charlie um this week is a big week for the canadian premier league as well we're gonna yeah. get into that as well but 
I do want to say that this Canadian Premier League story is, that, that it is linked with this with Canada soccer. You know, this is, a, I think our friend Martin Bailey put it best recently on Twitter in terms of what a credible month we have for Canadian soccer. We've got the Canadian Championship final live on One Soccer at one o'clock on Sunday. CF Montreal against Toronto FC. Justin Morrow's finale. What a wonderful man he is. He's been on our show as well. And then the two Canadian semifinals. We're going to get to previewing them as well. We've just had an unbelievable week uh, for Canada soccer. So it's not just about what kind of soccer achieving on the field and the results that is a pinch me moment. It's what we're witnessing right now in the month of November in this wonderful country, is it not? Yeah. And we kind of spoke about this, I think a couple of weeks ago on the, on the podcast, like we knew that all of these games were coming and we knew that there is going to be so many different trophies on the line and, and just, I mean, things that are, are going on because we've got forge in the CONCACAF league next week as well. Right. Which should not be, should not be understated at all, but there's just so much going on and it's hard to, maybe take a moment and breathe and just realize you know in a sense how lucky we are that all this is is happening at the same at the same time yes but just happening at all mm. you know that we've got this league that's with these these players and these teams that are, are playing these massive games you know the mls teams in the canadian championship and obviously the national team is is just doing some incredible stuff and it's just fun to be along for the ride to be honest <laughs> it is fun and i think the team is fun no i mean they're they're yeah. a very relatable team i'm sure a lot of people have been getting the comments you people are on the show for a, for a reason you're watching us for a reason you're an enormous soccer fan in canada thank you for spending some time on a thursday afternoon or evening with us by the way and i'm sure you've all got these comments that we've all got from other people at the moment you know texting us about this team and finding out a little bit about it and when they come on for the ride, what they're finding, Charlie, is you both encapsulated in our pieces written this week. And what I tried to explain in one soccer broadcast is they are a fun team to get behind. No, oh, they're yeah. a young, vibrant team. They represent everything that is so special about Canada, their background, and also the way that they play the game in going at these opponents. That, that wasn't the kind of game the other night, but it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, so I think that is something for people to start getting into. We saw the numbers come out today. I tweeted it. You know, a lot of people watching that game for you know watching this team genuinely for for the first time, right? And it's important that they are relatable. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, in international football, we've seen teams have success, especially at things like major tournaments. We've seen teams have more success than they've had in the past, and maybe surprise people by playing, for lack of a better term, boring football. Yeah. Right. We've seen teams kind of go far and, and have these miracle runs. But when you actually watch them, they're not that interesting. <laughs> Canada are not that at all, are they? You know, they're oh. doing things that, that nobody expects. They're doing things that I don't even know if they're things that nobody expects anymore, actually, right. because I think we're at a point where we're starting to expect them. But Canada's doing things that haven't traditionally been expected of this program or, you know, this program's obviously been underrated for a very long time and, and hasn't achieved a lot in the last, you know, 20 years but they're doing it in a way that's just so extremely likable and just so attractive and such a good advertisement for the game. You know, if you do tune into one of these games and you watch this team play, they're going to reward you for that with playing, you know, the the most fun kind of this sport that maybe there is. I don't necessarily know if they were able to play their most attractive brand of football in Edmonton. Right. But, you know, the spectacle itself and the conditions and the weight of it all kind of made up for that, didn't it? It certainly did. The, p the pitch wasn't great, you know. No, uh, it, no, was, it was not near great. And uh, but you know they got six points, and that's the most important thing. Um, tons of people in here. I know a lot of people get shy in asking the questions, but please put them in. Now's the time to get your Canadian questions in uh, before we get to our, our, you know, our round table of guests, but only bringing in <laughs> one chair at a time. A uh, great table of guests that we're going to have. And also, if you don't want to ask a question and you're a little bit shy, maybe just type a number down the side. I want to know how many points Canada's going to get in World Cup qualifying. Uh, give me a little points prediction there on the right hand side to 16 points to eight games so currently averaging two points per game write your numbers down there conrad said it says is sam adekubi celebration a representation of how much energy and passion this generation of our national team has yeah very well put and also just how much fun they're having together yeah charlie that's that came that came out in all of our uh, beyond the pitch interviews that we've done is this genuine camaraderie about this team that is clearly uh, on the pitch it, it, you can see it together and um you know what about that celebration? Where, where do we want to start? Do you want to start with a Stacchio getting picked up on the pitch or Adekubi jumping in the snow, Laren falling on the yeah. ground and everyone just kind of 
it, it, it looked like Laren was like, you know, that bobsled when you get in the bobsled and you're about to right drive it and then everyone yeah, piles yeah, in the back. It was kind of like, it, kind it looked of like he was like getting kind of in like a 10 man bobsled or something. It was, a, it was, it was tremendous. <laughs> 10 man bobsled. <laughs> so the, the Eustachia one, I couldn't see it. Do you know who it was that ran out and picked him up? I'm not sure. I think it was a member of the coaching staff because he had his I big black so. coat on. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think that was caught on the TV cameras, was it? No, I think it was just, uh, it was just your your yeah. clip that you got from from your guys he's like boots. he stood and did like the ronaldo pose yeah. as he stood the ball in which was just <laughs> you know swagger at the best like canada soccer just doesn't do swagger until like recently that was Very swagger recently. right there yeah. that was <laughs> that was great by the way there were so many moments of of that swagger over these two games i mean even eustachio coming out of the the scrum at the end and just pumping up the crowd with his fist pump yeah just all yeah. over but back to that celebration man yeah kyle laren just immediately sitting down in the snow everybody embracing it yeah. i think the real the real like important thing here is that canada were having fun right. i know it was whatever minus 10 and we've talked i know there's been so much debate over what the conditions would do whether it would actually be an advantage for canada but the players themselves seem to like it they seem right. to win, like embrace it and enjoy it and i think that is kind of the point right even yeah. if it if it isn't necessarily an advantage tangibly or, or in a physical sense the players certainly felt like it was and i i know that the mexican players did not look like they were having fun for a no. single second of that i mean all the players have told us many times when they get together they feel like they're getting together with their buddies right like they're going on yeah. like this 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 business trip with their, with their mates right they come away from the clubs and they yeah. go to canada soccer as well um let me see some questions and some answers here on the side for the for the points totals uh, let's see. Phil thinks 28. Nick says 28. Will says 25. Um, Ryan, any chat about overseas interest in Alistair Johnston? There must be after his recent rise. Clearly, uh, Ryan. Yeah, bang on. People watching Alistair very closely um, as being an outstanding defender, both in a three and a back four or a five. Uh, Stuart from Calgary here says, how many more wins do you think Canada needs to finish in the top three? How many more wins? Uh, two, I think. Two wins, uh, probably maybe more than yeah. yeah. That might be enough. I think two more wins is fine, right? I've, I've said all along twenty-one points. And I think they'll get there, and uh, I don't think Pan uh, Panama have got a reasonably easy schedule at home, but they don't travel well. They've still got to go to Mexico and they've got to go to the United States, so that's a massive advantage for for Canada. And now everyone, look, John Herbin was telling us on Monday he thinks he's probably going to go down to the wire. That was before they beat Mexico. I think now it's fair to say that that game against Panama, match day fourteen, the final match. I think Canada don't want any part of being involved in the game where they don't want that game to matter. <laughs> that matter. Yeah. No, you know? Uh, so let's, uh, let's hope that, that that's not the case. Uh, at this point, that's when you, you beat Mexico, you get bonus points as well yeah. on that. A uh, thousand sunny 12 is Canada soccer messing with us soccer by delaying the venue announcement. Um, no inside information. I would just say, I would very much doubt that um, they genuinely, uh, and I was speaking to a few people in there genuinely aren't sure. Uh, in terms of what they're going to do. It's getting closer, um, but yeah, watch this space. Uh, thanks, Petra, for tuning in from the UK. Appreciate the love for Canada. Thank you, Brian, for the uh, for your comments as well. Um, he says, the commitment to the program that Azorio, Laren, Adekubi, Hutchinson, Boyan, Henry, all these players have been there since Octavio Zambrano. Well, indeed, Atipo Hutchinson all the way back since 2003, uh, getting 90 caps and taking over the great Julian de Guzman as well. So that was fantastic to see that going forward. Uh, John says, is Laren a lock up front over David, or do you think it will be a game-by-game -game basis? Uh, Charlie, I'll let you take that one, but I think it's pretty clear. Well, I think it does. It, it it's always going to be a game by game basis, yeah. right? I mean, you can't you can't ever call a player a lock to start over the leading scorer in France, right? Um, and just just as an aside, it was absurd that Canada were up two nil on Mexico and brought Jonathan David onto the pitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that genuinely made me laugh like a madman. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is going to be going to be game by game. They're fairly different players who offer different different skill sets and yes you know jonathan david played very well against costa rica and he scored right. his goal and then laren was the hero on tuesday so yeah i trust john herman to make that choice more than i would yeah it's a big call right a big call to yeah. leave out jonathan david in a match like that you know i was certainly surprised but at the, at the end of the day 
it's difficult to play both of them together in that kind yeah. of system and they made the choice and in the end both of them won them the games <laughs> you know exactly laren on a tuesday and david on a friday so who cares right they, <laughs> they, they won them the games every credit to them for getting that out there all right we'll continue to preview canada as the night goes on all the way up till eight o'clock we've got great guests and we start with probably the best guest let's bring him in our <laughs> midfield general in the canadian premier league manny aparicio uh here he is manny how are you mate good to see you hey how's everything how's everything going yeah, we're doing great. We can't thank you enough for joining us. I know we're not that far away from your big semi-final on Saturday in Calgary. We're going to get to that in a second. But I want to start with your connections to Canada. Obviously, you played for Canada. This is a team that means a lot to you. Uh, what did that mean to you on Tuesday night watching the scenes in Edmonton? Yeah, it's beautiful to watch. I mean, uh, I was with Canada a lot through many ups and many, many downs uh with u20s with u17s with men's with every age group i can remember you know games where they just wouldn't go our way i remember hearing your commentary when the game ended there of uh you know the way they they're winning the games now not just scraping out wins but you know outplaying opponents and and being at that world stage um i think it's what we've all wanted for canada um and to be able to see the team doing well is amazing for us it absolutely is i mean Manny, just as somebody who's involved in the game, you're a player in Canada. When you see a game that happens like that and you see that there's numbers that, you know, X million people watch that game, what does that like what does that make you feel about, you know, the game in this country and just how how positive this whole momentum is for for everything, the league, the the national team, just everything? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I, I remember when I first, you know, immigrated to Canada in in the early two thousands where you know, soccer or football wasn't even one of the primary sports in the country. And, and you know, we had hockey and American football and I would say even lacrosse maybe up there before soccer and and how much it's grown. Uh, personally, I've seen it, you know, through my career. Um, and, and even, for example, us, we had, we had a gym session while the game was going on and we had a laptop there and on the TV just projected watching the whole game and we're more worried about that than our workout of the day because you know that's it's our national team it's it's our pride and yeah we all come from different parts as you can see from from the starting 11 and the bench and everything but you know it's it's the biggest pride for us is representing Canada and, and watching our national team grow and before we get into the specifics about Saturday's match let's just have a quick question about the league itself Manny a league that convinced you to come here and a league that is thriving and you've been a big part of that because we know now as the conversation extends about Canada's success and gets to the world level and if they make it to the World Cup we know that people will start talking about the, the Canadian Premier League the way that they have done in the United States when they hosted the World Cup in 1994 and then they started to go on and on and people talked about MLS as being a boost yeah. how do you see the CPL playing a big part in that and how much have you seen even this season the standard continue to rise even though you're playing so many games every week yeah it just keeps on getting better and, and like you said you know by canada making the world cup and not just hosting it uh, i think that's going to speak volumes you know us being in first right now in conquer cup i don't think anyone would have thought that in the beginning of the of the qualifying round um but you know it just speaks levels to it i think the league's going to keep on growing because of it as well and at the end of the day, all these kids that uh, obviously I'm I'm a bit older now, but all the kids that you're seeing now, 17, 18, 19 years old, debuting in CPL and and getting games, getting regular, you know, pro minutes in three, four, five years, you're gonna see them there. I, I have no doubt about that. Uh, either by staying in the CPL or by moving on to bigger and better things and then eventually getting into the national team. Uh, that's what this league's for. And and hopefully, you know, we can just help it keep on getting better. So speaking of the CPL, I think this is probably a good time to talk about this this playoff game that you guys have coming up on Saturday. You're going to Calgary. Probably won't be as cold as Edmonton was, but you know, I, I was looking at the it's weather. It looks, it looks like it's it looks like it's a little chilly. I think there's I'm a, still there's a little my snow coat, coming. Charlie. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm still taking my coat. I, I don't so know what ahead. the what the snow situation might be, but yeah, Manny, you guys, you Pacific team have had some big games this year. You've had some big games against Cavalry, but playoff semifinal just how excited have you guys been this whole week leading up to this yeah it's uh, it's been our first week that we've been able to have a regular training week in the whole season i would say uh so it feels a little bit weird right now um but yeah like you said you know we had big games uh, but our mentality right now is you know whatever we did before it is what it is 
uh, it's a knockout game. It's a semifinal game, and it's 90 minutes or 120 minutes, whatever it may be. Uh, and we have to go out there to win whichever way possible. Obviously, we know it's going to be cold. It's going to be icy and whatever is thrown our way. But it's the same for both teams. So, you know, we got to go out there and just try to do our best. I think if if we come out the way we've played in those big games, like you mentioned, uh, I, I have every, you know, no doubt in my mind that we, we can win this game. Manny, you mentioned the big games. Phil says, by the way, in the comments, great performance against the Whitecaps and you were the man of the match that day. <laughs> and what a special performance that was. What, you know, you, you're you obviously a very consistent performer for this Pacific team. I'm so glad we've had you on because you are a crucial cog to what's going to happen this weekend to try and get to the final. But is there something about big games where you just come alive a bit more? I remember Palmer Ducar saying that obviously your first year there, you've had some adjustment periods, but in big games, you always seem to rise. Was it, is there something about the big games that gets the heart rate going a little bit more? You want to feel like you can make a bigger difference? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always say, uh, I think that's, any game you know any athlete any professional athlete not just football i think that's the games you should play for i mean you everything's on the line you have nothing to lose um you know that's the games as, as athletes as uh, i'm i hate to lose i i'm i'm a winner and obviously I, it, sometimes it doesn't go your way but that's just things like you know i could be playing cards with my little brother and now i want to win you know what i mean like it's it's something that uh, is I, i've had it in me my whole life and and those games, yeah, maybe it is a little bit of the of the situation where some people might shy away, but for me, it's just everything's on the line. It's even better. Um, but yeah, you know, you you do try to do good every game, not just the big ones. But yeah, I think there is always a little special feeling there as well. Yeah, I, I want to give another quick shout out to Phil here for at Cold Field. It's not quite as good as Ice Teca, but I think it's, <laughs> it's pretty solid. That's a good one. Pretty good. <laughs> I was I was looking for something like that, so thank you. Um, Manny, just I think it's important to to talk in this game about you know the fact that you guys are playing cavalry again. I know that you guys have played them I think seven times this year, including yeah. you know a I'm knockout good. game at at Calgary in the Canadian Championship, which you guys won, of course. But yeah. <laughs> just when you see a team this many times and then you come up against them in a playoff game in a knockout game, what is that like as a player? Yeah, I mean it's not the usual. Um, mm -hmm. It's all, it almost feels like you're playing like your teammates again at the end of the day because it's it, this is the eighth time we're going to be playing them, uh, and especially knowing half the team already from previous years or playing with them uh, at, at other clubs or national teams. So it, it does feel very familiar. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, we know we have a small league. It's only you know so many teams in the league. So I, I do think that league did a right by by making it kind of like an east and west and and us crossing over in the bubble uh because we didn't know how this you know the pandemic was going to affect it long term uh so i do think it was done the right way obviously now looking back maybe we could have traveled a bit more but at the time you know that's how the schedule was was, was made and that's i think that's how it should have been made um so yeah you know we just we go there we it does give each team a little bit of an advantage tactically where you you know how each other plays um, and, and yeah, maybe, maybe it'll be more of a tactical game up to the, the two head coaches to see who breaks the other one down a little bit better. Manny, you, you guys were the pace setters for most of the year, top of the table for a long period of the time, obviously fell to third near the end. And, and I think everyone would admit that, you know, you know, over the last few weeks, not, you know, you had that brilliant game against Edmonton where you destroyed them 5-1, but the results were a little bit disappointing. What's it going to take for your team? What, what are the key ingredients to your team when you're at your best to go out there and dictate the game? Yeah, I think I think we were missing, you know, a little bit in those last few games. Like you said, maybe it was just, you know, complacency, knowing we were already in or, or whatever it was. Um, but but yeah, I, I think, you know, when when we're at our best is when we're we're, you know, we're all pressing high and, and, and high energy team. Um, I think, yeah, I think looking back at every game we've done well is when we bring out the energy and we're the, you know the front runners and we're winning every first and second ball and we're we're just demanding more of each other and and the other team usually just crumbles under that pressure um so i think if we can come out with that mentality uh we'll be good to go yeah it's the same thing i think we've spoken about the white caps game already but obviously it was the intensity right and the the hunger that you guys had you kind of were first to every second ball you just seem to want it more than them just is that a kind of game that you look at and you're like we need to you know, we need to we need to match that. We need to do what we did there and figure out how to repeat that. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I, you know, when, when one guy does it and two guys do it, and then it's just, it's a contagious thing when that, that, that energy is that high. Uh, and then our whole team is, you know, is buzzing off it. Um, I think, like you said, I guess the white caps, we showed it in the first, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes. And I think that just, you know, kept on trailing on throughout the 90 minutes. So I think the biggest part for us is starting right, starting on the right foot uh, with our intensity and us leading the game. Um, and, and, and I think everyone else will follow. Yeah. Manny, let me ask you about your coach. Obviously, Palmer Ducard, one of the big personalities of our league. And um, you know, I think he's got an unbelievable future. That's my own point. But I'm not coached by him every day. So I'd love to know what you think of him and in terms of what does he make uh, you guys a difference? How does he, what, what makes him so special when you work with him on a daily basis? Yeah, he is. He is a great coach. Um, obviously, when it comes to, to tactical and, and, and all that stuff, him and James, you know, they've been at the top um and and obviously you can see that in the way they see the game and the way they try to portray that to us um but like i was just talking about i think that that energy and that you know kind of killer mentality that we've come out with most games i think that that comes from them uh, i think you guys can see it on the bench sometimes when when he goes a bit crazy and stuff but it, it is that that is the passion he has for the game uh and he's translating that into us um that's one of the reasons i was drawn to here as well you know i saw that mm. passion just from playing against them and seeing them in that in that bubble in pei um and i feel like i do have that same passion as well i you know football's my life um and you can see that with him you know day in day out he's there at 7 a.m and leaves at 6 p.m and you know it's just the little details that you, you see a guy invested into the game and wanting to grow and and wants to keep on getting better so as players you know you can't really ask for much more of a, of a leader right so right um when when we run you know our tails off on the pitch and stuff it's usually because we have we know we have a, a guy behind us that just wants us to do the best for ourselves the other thing that's kind of struck me about pacific especially under under pa is just kind of how how close this group seems to have become and how much this there seems to be a pretty good level of you know camaraderie and and just togetherness in this group i you weren't on the team at the island games last year but i'm thinking back to at the end of the tournament when pa did one of his press conferences while barbecuing with the team <laughs> out on the patio and it just seems like there's a good you know for lack of a better word vibe around this team yeah. i don't know if if it feels the same as a player who's in that group yeah i mean like you know he is a good leader and he he knows when to to make it straight and, and have it his way. But at the same time, you know, he was a player not too long ago. So I think he can relate a little bit when, when, you know, some training sessions, maybe it should be a little bit more fun or in certain moments, just laugh things out when the guy skies a ball 50 yards over the net, where maybe some other coaches would get pissed and he just knows, okay, like that's football, you know, not everything's going to go perfect. Um, so I think, you know, him being an ex player and, and only retiring only a few like, years ago, um, I think it gives him that that hand and and being that close to the players and and, and having such a tight knit group there. A couple more questions and a great obviously interview so far. Thank you for your time, Manny. I appreciate you from Pacific. I want to ask you this: um, you chose that area. Obviously, you talked about Palmer Car, but and I know you don't get to play a home playoff game now, but you have a chance. By the way, you could host a final if you win the game yeah. and York wins. So it's still very up possible. But what's it been like playing on the island? What's that like location like? How have you been? You know, walking the streets, going to training. What's it been like? How are they relating to the team? And obviously, even broader scale on that wider scale, Vancouver coming into the Canadian Premier League in 2023. You yeah. know, what's the, what, what are you getting in the West Coast vibe towards this sport right now? How's it feeling? I think it's growing a lot. Um, obviously, we, we talked a bit about just how the game's growing in Canada already. But even here, I remember coming in 2019 uh, and it was huge. You know, the, the environment and, and the fans and everything was was massive. I remember, you know, leaving and, and just loving to play that game. Um, and then obviously with COVID, maybe it hit a little bit. Obviously, we're not at full capacity still here. Um, but it, it is electric when, when we have those special nights and uh, mainly on, on the weekends when people are able to come out a little bit more. You know, football here is growing a lot. Um, you see signs around the city. You see, you know, banners. Uh, you see the flags when you drive by the stadium, people wearing the sweaters and tubes. So it, it is a, it is very much a sports city. And and I think, you know, Pacific is, is on the front foot there where it's the first pro team as well here. Um, so I think it keeps on growing and it keeps on getting better. And, and obviously now with the World Cup and everything coming in, um, I think it's just going to keep on getting better as well. 
Yeah, obviously, Manny, you're a player who came up through the Toronto FC system, right? Which is now a very established club in Canada. The biggest club in Canada, I think, is not even a question. But just for yourself, now that you're you're in a different location, are you seeing these signs of, you know, the game taking root in, you know, all these other places in the country? You mentioned a few there, but it's got to be pretty special to see it kind of spreading like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like I said, I think, <laughs> I don't know how many of my friends and stuff I can name that aren't, that or don't come from immigrant parents or or the immigrants themselves and stuff. And I think soccer is the biggest sport in the world and it's just going to keep on growing. You know, we all come from soccer backgrounds and, and I think soccer is Canada's uh, sport. As much as, you know, we're good at hockey and stuff, I think in, in the next years, you're going to see that soccer is our sport. Uh, you have so many kids signing up. We have the WAVE program here, which is kind of like the academy um that just keeps on growing there's more and more teams coming through uh more competition as well for them so if you're starting younger with competition and good competition it's just going to keep on getting better um i think soccer's here to stay i think we've proven that already uh so hopefully it just keeps on growing last one for you manny what would it mean to you and the team to beat cavalry saturday oh it'd be amazing i mean we want to get into that final uh and we want to win the, the whole thing um, obviously, like you mentioned, we, we had a great start to the season, you know, good, good in the middle as well, but then kind of fell off now. Um, so hopefully this week we, we had of training, we, we, we grouped enough to, to be able to go there and win. Uh, we know the conditions are going to be bad. So we're, we're just going, you know, uh, with everything we got and then we'll see where we play the, the final. Hopefully it's here at home. Hopefully York can, can do us a favor there and we can get our home fans behind us for that final game. That's what I was about to say. I was just about to say, yeah. you get to cheer on York again if you win the game. <laughs> there you go. I, mean, I won't be cheering, but yeah, it's... Yeah, there you, go. You, have every, you have every right to. If you get to win that game, you can cheer on York and host them. Hey, listen, yeah. thanks for the smiles. Thanks for all your answers, man. I really appreciate it. We can't thank you enough for all the great work you do on and off the pitch in this league. Uh, we'll see you in Calgary. Enjoy it. That's the main thing. Thank Enjoy you. it and go out there and yeah. make a difference. Manny F. Thank you. Thanks, thanks again. Thank Take you. Care. Great guest, Manny Apriso. And he's been awesome for them, no? I mean, it's been a terrific season for them so far. And we're going to get Tommy Wilden Jr. on very soon. Stick around. And, of course, Kwame will be up at 7.30. Two brilliant personalities, by the way, coming up. Two of the best personalities (laughs) in the Canadian Premier League. Uh, So we'll have both of them coming up very soon. A reminder, we're going to give away Football Manager 2022 to a lucky viewer shortly. uh, But you have to comment. So don't be shy. Uh, But, Charlie, what your thoughts? Before we get to Calvary and we get Tommy on in the next five minutes, your thoughts on Pacific. They go in as underdogs, no? I mean, they yes. were the, the runaway leaders for some time. Uh, they went to at Cofield and won in the Cups. They've done a knockout game there. But it isn't that long ago that they went to there and they got... Joe Mason scored the goal. It was only 1-0 Cavalry, but they didn't have a shot on target that day and they got pretty much outplayed. So you can't help but thinking that Ca- Cavalry will start as a favourites in this one. I think so. I think so. I think even the last two games that Cavalry played against Pacific this year, they got the better of them. Pacific might have had the upper hand in the first few meetings, and they certainly outplayed Cavalry in the Canadian Championship at Atco Field, of course, which is important to remember. Yeah, 1 0, right? It was a 1 0 game. Yeah, 1 0. But yeah, I think Cavalry have had the better of the last few meetings between these teams. And, you know, they're, they are at home as well. We don't, we've mentioned we don't know what the weather's going to be like. But, you know, they've been training in it all week in Calgary. Uh, But Pacific, obviously, I mean, they're here for a reason. They can absolutely win this game. They have every every possibility of doing it. They just need to be on the front foot. They need to get the wingers up high and pin those fullbacks back like they love to do. Yeah. And they just need that quality in the box from, you know, whether it's Diaz or Taryn Campbell. They just need to finish those chances. They do have attackers who can really hurt. No, I mean, if Bustos or no Bustos, Diaz, Campbell, Heard, you know, we mentioned Aparicio. Like they, they have players who can make a difference in that final third of the pitch. And sometimes that can be the difference yeah. in knockout football, right? You go out there and be, I think what I look at it is Cavalry is stronger defensively. I think there's no doubt about that, right? Whether they play well, a three or a four, McNaughton suspended is enormous. Especially because loss. of that, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to find out what they do with that, right? Because usually in the, what we've seen, you know, we've seen her jab report play there at part in parts. You know, so it'd be interesting to see who they put there. You know, Baldissimo might play there. Yeah. You know, what do you think? Yeah, I I don't know. You can't change too much. No. You don't. You certainly don't want to take a player out of another position where right. he he's important to you and put him right. in center back. 
So I think I think I would probably go with Baldissimo. I think he's the guy that played center back in that last game of the season. Yes. He hasn't played a whole lot recently. He's only recently gotten back to full health. I think that was his first start of the year. I actually. think it was, yeah. 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 I mean, we know Matthew Baldissimo was a great player. He was fantastic for them in the two previous seasons. Yeah. So if he comes into form, he's healthy, he's good to go and play center back. That's awesome. That's right. fantastic for Pacific, and that's a, that's a huge, huge boon. But it is a question mark over this team, and it'll be interesting to see what Pamaduka goes with. Yeah, I saw some comments there, and it seems like some foot soldiers are in the chat. By the way, you are hosting, <laughs> think about this, you'll be hosting the first ever Canadian Premier League semifinal, right? First ever one, right? This doesn't get any better than, than this in terms of the way that their structures is right now. And I know they've had different things last year in different formats, but here we go. Like, this is it, right? This is... uh. This is two versus three, and um, I know one versus four we're going to get into in the second half of the show, but one versus four, and York will have a lot to say about that because they've been to Tim Hortons Field twice already this year and won, but oh, yeah. one versus four will feel like a true forge versus an underdog, no? This, I know Cavalry are favorites, but this is like flip a coin, guys. Like two versus three, like this, it could go either way. That's how they, these teams know each other. It could have gone, you know, it wasn't an East versus Western seeding, Charlie. It just happened to be this, yeah. where we got the two teams who played a lot on both sides of the draw. Uh, and, I, and I think that's great. But uh, yeah, so many Calgary fans, Cavalry fans here from <laughs> Calgary coming in. Uh, Conrad says he thinks it's going to be minus 20 with the wind chill. I don't, I don't know about that. that. I don't know about that. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> 1 p.m. Back. local time, I think. Yeah, so off. expect the sun and the shadow to yeah. go over that to that to that side of the field. Uh, no matter what the weather will be like, and he's not here yet, but Tommy Wilden Jr. will be dressed like a dapper gentleman, right? Yeah, we, we, we all absolutely. This. I'm I'm expecting a good hat as well. I think good that'll hat. be important. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like a, what like was a flat that? cap. Where kinda. was that? He was rocking the the Liam Gallagher look. Was that in the rain in Edmonton once? Parker. Yeah. Yeah. He looked like Liam because he, he made good. a joke about some Oasis songs, which was always great with that. So. <laughs> when that when good. have we ever done that? No, I've never <laughs> done that on our show, ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Ryan says, Baldissimo has that positive on the ball presence that McNaughton provides could be key for his inclusion. Good analysis. I like it. I think that's probably why they went with him last time because obviously yeah. you want to spray the ball. McNaughton is really good at that. You know, that cross field diags um, and, and, and sending them fullbacks go. That was, uh, you know, that's big. And, and will they get their fullbacks forward? You know, particularly Chung or, or, yeah. or Kundi Dada Lucas played well lately as well, yep. Charlie. So that could be a, an interesting inclusion to do that as well. Um, but yes, here we go. Alberta. Uh, hosting the first semi-final in Calgary and then Ontario. If you're around on Sunday, get yourself to Tim Hortons Field as Forge take on York in the uh, all-Ontario derby there for that as well. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Patrick says, he makes me worry. I'm not sure who he's talking about. I don't know about, who he is. Yeah, who's he? Let us know, Patrick, in the <laughs> chat there and to find out where we're going. We don't know about Bustos, right? We don't know whether no. he's going to be fit or not. Um, it is clear that they've they have missed him. Right, Charlie, I think that's evident. I mean, whenever yep. you're going to miss an MVP caliber player, uh, they haven't said it. They haven't used it as an excuse. Um, but, you know, it, it, he is that the X factor that they're probably not going to have on the pitch that in a tight playoff game could have been important. So it'll be interesting. Uh, quickly and, before and we just go ahead. Just on, on Bustos, I mean, considering the, the time he missed, you know, considering how close the schedule or the, the schedule and the standings were, yeah. if they'd had him for a few more of those games down the stretch, who knows? Maybe this game isn't in, in Calgary, but it's true. We, yeah. we won't know. We'll never know. Uh, you know, I would imagine our next guest will be happily remind me and you, though, that they've had their own fair share of injuries, have they not? Absolutely. Cavalry FC, I think they've had a lot of injuries himself. Here is the man himself, uh, looking as ever dapper, Mr. Tommy Wielden Jr. Good evening, sir. How are you? Evening, gents. Yeah, just uh, trying to plan our assault for the playoffs. It's uh, just that <laughs> exciting time of year. Now, do you want to move your camera? Are you giving any secrets away? Is the stuff behind you on the tactics board deliberately set up to try and confuse people? Like, throw us a, you know, let us know what's going on here. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> if we can see right now, I can see a back three there with the thing. You know, let us know if that's a problem. Is that is that the Mexico formation from it's, Tuesday night? Maybe it is. There you go. <laughs> well, formations, you know, mate. Formations are just how you name your lineup. Everything else is about the four <laughs> moments of the game. So that's, if, that's if, that, if that's how we look consistently, then have at it, guys. But it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just hey, the starting love, place. 
I love that you keep us guessing. And even when you see your 11, you never know what you're doing because there's so much tactical versatility. I'm yeah. going to get into that in a second. We've got lots to say uh, about that game. But we start with this. Um, as a proud Canadian, as I know you are, what did Tuesday night mean to you watching those scenes from Edmonton? And I know you were playing here in Forge, but I, I, you have seen it. Uh, what did it mean to you watching it? Do you, do you know what was great is uh, I think I'll talk about generational because, you know, I feel like a, like yourself, you're an adopted Canadian. Like I feel that. And for a country that's welcomed me and you see the amount of players and staffing on the Canadian national team, we're one big melting pot of cultures here in this country. And that's probably what is our superpower. And John Erdman has, has brought that together. But after the game against Forge on Tuesday, I was, fortunate to then go and watch the game with my team in the Moxie's pub underneath the hotel. And <laughs> I had Martin Nash to my left and Nick Ledgewood to my right, as well as all the other staff, you know, uh, and, and young players like Victor Latore as well. And what you're seeing with that is you see Sammy Adekubi d- doing what he's doing as a player that I've known since he was, you know, 12 or 13. Uh, but, but you talk to Martin about his experiences through it and you see Nick Ledgewood and they're still sowing the seeds to this. You're seeing that, you know, players like Alistair Johnson to Sam Adagubi to Alfonso Davies coming through on this non-linear pathway that we've created uniquely in this in this uh, in this country. And then to to be part of, you know, this Canadian Premier League that is growing and growing. And you sometimes have to stop yourself and just think, wow, we're part of something special here that when I came here 20 years ago, players like Martin Nash and Nick Ledgewood had to leave Canada to to forage a, a, a pathway. I played against Atiba Hutchinson. I played with Nick Ledgewood as, you know, 17 year olds they were. And, and, and Atiba had to leave Toronto Lynx to, to make the career he's got. And now we've got other players that are able to stay and play and then go overseas. And uh, to, to see us compete with, you know, some of the top players in the world and the perennial uh, Mexico, the perennial champions of, of this, this, region is uh is so good and to see it in alberta uh, and to see you know a couple of albertans on there as well is is uniquely special yeah it was very special i mean we've spoken about it earlier in this show as well just to when you step back and think about just this month of november in canadian soccer right these canada games cpl playoffs the canadian championship final forge in the Concacaf league this is incredible, right? There's there's a lot going on here. It's a lot to take stock of. But Tommy, just as somebody who's been around the game in this country a long time, you know, coached national team programs. You've spoken to me already in the past about when you coached Davies and, and David at youth levels and so on. Just how much has this been a long time coming and, and you know, something that has taken a lot of work for decades? It is. And uh, John Erdman said it best that the, uh, we were at the AGM in 2018 where we were announced as a professional club and ourselves and Rob Friend and Josh Simpson and you know Jimmy Brennan as, as former players and and John had got up there and recently just changed from the men's to the women's and you know he talked very directly very inspirational as he is and said listen you know I'd like to take everyone with us grab a shovel you know do your part and if you're not get out my way that's all I ask and I thought it was so powerful and and that's what we're doing here in Calgary and and, uh, and I probably speak for my colleagues across the country are working or, or whether you're part of, you know, the youth sports nationals that are going on right now or, mm-hmm. you know, whether you're in a youth club elsewhere, you're thinking that, you know, all the youth clubs that went to do or watch the games up in Edmonton or went to, you know, BMO Place to watch, you know, the, the, the national team there or, you know, when the women came back with their Olympic gold and went out to, to Ottawa or Montreal and if you're supporting them, then you're doing your part. You're now helping fund the program, support the program, tell people about it. I say it to our fans, and we're growing each year. Bring a plus one. That's how we keep growing the game. Just tell everyone your experience. Bring a plus one, and they'll do the same. And the product is that good. Once you're in, you are hooked. Yeah, no doubt about it. Great words and a great piece on our campl.ca site published yesterday by our own Marty Thompson about the U-Sports and the championship this week and the, mm. and the pathway towards Cavalry FC and many other teams here mm-hmm. in the CPL. Get your questions in for Tommy on the side. We've got about 10 minutes with him before his big, obviously, big weekend, so we don't want to take up too much time. But Charlie and I have the privilege of talking to this man every week. So if you have some questions, please put them in. Uh, we'll start with previewing this weekend. Cavalry against Pacific in a semi-final. 
I would say, Tommy, that if they were offered that at the start of the season, a home playoff game, uh, you'd have taken it right away. How excited are you to West uh, to, to inv- invite everybody to Atco Field and, and go out there and try and win and be that representation from the West? Oh, absolutely. Listen, uh, I've said it all along, you know, the league table never lies. And, uh, and, and the opponents we've got facing, you know, Pacific led the league table for a long time. And I couldn't think of a more worthy opponent to play against because... Pamadou Carr and, and, and James Merriman have done a terrific job with that team. They're a, they're, they're a team. They've had two weeks to prep for us since we beat them here in uh, the, the last time we played them. So we know that they're going to come all guns blazing and they'll need to because it's going to be a cold cold day here on Saturday. Uh, but our fans coming home in what has been such a really weird season to, to reflect back on where we started in a bubble and you couldn't leave for 35 days to when you got home, you were forever leaving every third day, uh, so you weren't grounded. And then we've had our home stand on the last little while. But, you know, we're where we are. We're where we're meant to be. You know, we finished tied on points with Forge. We're the second seed. And we've got that home playoff berth. And our home pitch is a tough place to come and get results. And we intend to use every single advantage because you need them in playoffs, especially against a quality side like Pacific. Absolutely. I think uh, I think if anybody didn't know already that it's cold in Alberta, they probably learned that on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Just yes, they did. After this whole long season, it's it's. I mean, it, it feels like it actually only started a few months ago, but when you think about it, it has been quite a long season and challenging for every team. It feels sort of right for Cavalry to be playing Pacific in this playoff game. Mm-hmm. Just considering how many times you guys have met each other. I think six times in the league, a seventh time in the Canadian Championship. Just what are what are these are these games like for you guys for as managers? Just when you see a team this many times and you start to develop a bit of a I don't know if we if we call it a rivalry or not, but when you start to just develop a familiarity, what is this like as a coaching staff? It's interesting because I think it has become a rivalry and a healthy one at that. It's 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 competitive, it's feisty. You look at the cards that are being distributed. Yeah. But I tell you, there's there's a genuine respect for both sides. You know, we have a mutual respect for uh, for them as a team and their coaching staff and their ownership group. And also, you know, we see with with their stadium, the way they built it was very similar to ours. There's, you know, a, a synergy in that. Um, they have a distinct style of play and, you know, they, they play a nice brand of attacking football and, you know, build out from the back and have some terrific players that uh, free scoring. Um, you know, and, and if you were to liken them to they're more like a Man City and a Pep Guardiola total football, I think we're more of a Liverpool that are in your face and, and attack minded. We're looking to attack. And what's funny about both games is I don't think either side has really gone away from their philosophies too much. And I think that's what's really good is because they tilted the balance when they started, you know, coming out of the bubble. They had more home games against us than we did. So they tilted the balance and then the flow came the other way after the can champ was it tilted back in our favor because we knew they had to come to our house. And uh, it's, it's been a terrific battle. And I tell you, the better they've got has made us even better ourselves because we've had to learn and evolve. And, you know, I never wanted to say this was a rebuild or regen or things like that. We're still Cavalry FC. We've just got some new personnel in it this year. And we had a big, big overhaul after the Island games but I think this is probably our most technical side we've had. And, and we've got more than one way to win a football match. I can't Hello. believe you called your own team Liverpool. That's got to hurt. I know. Everton fan. Everton fan calling him Liverpool. But you know what? Everton <laughs> hasn't had an identity for him to claim to. And he knows I'm right when he says that. That hurts. I know. But it, they haven't, right? <laughs> they, they haven't. And do you know what? I thought this all the time. And I'll tell you what Jurgen Klopp has done with Liverpool suits who Liverpool are as a city. You know, yeah, very right, hard yeah. working, very up and attack minded. They want to be entertained. And I knew, I knew even when Everton were looking at a new manager, was you thought somebody that came out of like the Ralph Ragnick school of football, or somebody who was attack minded like that and uh, pressing and in your face and hard work. And I think that suits. And actually, I think we have that personality profile for here in Calgary, very entrepreneurial, you know, mm-hmm. but it's a. Did we lose Tommy there for a minute, Charlie? It seems like we might have. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was me. We just lost him there. You know, you know what it was. It was giving compliments to Liverpool that he yeah. froze. That's why <laughs> Tommy will. Oh, he's back. I think he's back. back? Tommy, they they froze the screen there because you were complimenting Liverpool too much, mate. 
I know it's 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 one of my virus software protections that if I yeah. talk too confidently about Liverpool, it freezes me off. <laughs> we, we we got the gist that uh, I got some more questions about your players, but some great questions coming in here. Jeffrey wants to know if you went to a desert island, and you could only take one record with you. Who are you listening to? What one record? Is it an album or is it a song? You can pick, mate. We'll so give I'm you an album. You're going to be on a album. desert island. So. We'll give you a whole album. Yeah. Easy. Um, Oasis. What's the story? Morning Glory. Yes. Um, easy. <laughs> I knew so easy. <laughs> it's so easy, that one, because you can just belt it out. You can sing it and they've got some mood changes and some, you know, it, it's, it's a great album. And it takes me back to my apprentice days at Swindon Town as well. So there's that too. I love that. You probably wouldn't have listened because I don't think you probably listened to our podcast, but we had a podcast a few weeks ago where we dropped about 25 different Oasis <laughs> set song names during the podcast. It was just, Charlie was Brilliant. in heaven. It was, we loved it, it. was, uh, it, it was egregious. It was, it, it was fantastic. <laughs> and, we, and you've rocked the, uh, the look, right? The, the, uh, the Liam Gallagher look early on. Was that in Edmonton with that class hat? Was that what it was? Uh, Ed, Ed, Edmonton away. And you know, I had a few comments about that. I thought, yeah, it wasn't by design. It was just because, you know, it was, peeing it down there and I thought well that was the hat that kind of suited this massive head of mine so yeah. it just worked always rocking the style we love it <laughs> right Charlie oh absolutely absolutely uh, hey listen uh, Tommy let me ask you about you mentioned your style of play some of your players I want to ask you about new this year Joe Mason obviously going forward but mm-hmm. Klump Yao have been brilliant how have they made you mm-hmm. better how do they challenge you on a daily basis Great question, because I tell you, and this is the thing that we had to learn hard and fast. When you lose players like Dominic Zator, who is a quality player, and it was, well, sorry, he's not retired. He's, he yeah. is a quality player. Um, and Jay Wielden, who is probably, a, though he's my brother, he's underrated in terms of the leadership. He was the coach on the pitch. You've you've got some big shoes to fill. And uh, and I think we did that with Kreefa Yao as, as a young Canadian. To think he's only 21, he's, he's immense. You know, he is like a brick wall. You run into him, you don't look at – you know, Joe Mason and Novak are always like, oh, which team are we on for this? It's, I don't want to be against Yao because you know you're bouncing <laughs> off him. And you were right. at the game where we played him as a, as a left back. And yeah. uh, he's got the versatility to do so. Um, and, and I like that about him. And then, you know, in Dan Klomp, we were looking at, because we want to be a team that plays as well. You know, we might be a tough team, but we also have some great ball players. And coming out the back, you know, hence why we converted Davey Norman to be a ball player and centre-back versus being a, a defensive midfielder. And Dan Klomp just fit the remit. And, you know, we looked at, at his movement on the pitch. We looked at his, you know, Dutch upbringing, and he could play in a back three, he could play in a back four. He even played like as a, an auxiliary right back, we call it. And sometimes we have to put the brakes on him because he likes to just <laughs> maraud up the pitch. And, you know, when you've scored three or four goals in the season, sometimes you've got to give him that one, knowing that you've got big Karifa Yao or Davy Norman or Mason Trafford behind him. They just, you know, they're young, they're still learning, but they're progressive players. And that's what I think is making us better. And, the thing that strikes me is those ball playing center backs make the rest of the team better as well, right? When you've got wing backs like Mo Farsi or, or even Jose Escalante, they're free to get far up the pitch, mm-hmm. right? When you've got center backs that can play like that. Yeah. And um, what's great as well is, is for me, you know, football possession is what the opposition give you, you know, so it's not always about having these pretty little triangles and never progressing up the pitch. If a team sits low, you've got to find the triangles to move up accordingly. If a team wants to press you high, then you play in the space beyond. So it's having that ability to teach your players how to play what the opposition's given you. Pick the spots that they give you. Um, because otherwise, if you force a, a possession game down their throat, they'll just jam you. And then you're relying on individual ability. So I, I you know, these, these, I, I firmly believe that center backs and keepers now are, the, are like the, the, almost like the point guards or quarterbacks of your team now, because I think as you move up each layer, so if you take your back line, you know, it's usually about 20 passes per line that you're having. So when we were talking to Davey Norman about, you know, one of the plus points about becoming a defender, you're going to have 20 more passes per game. And when he's looking at it, he's like, Actually, that makes sense. So yeah. you're actually increasing that. So it's it's better to do that. What I love about this league is that looking at young players and thinking how they're going to progress and working under great coaches like you, you can do that. I look at Karifa Yao, and I'm going to make the statement that guy, that that boy, will play for for 
either John Herbert or whoever takes John Herbert's job. He's going to play for Canada, that guy. He's that good. Um, another young player that I want to talk to you about is what Conrad just asked. Tom, uh, Tommy, we saw a lot of Victor Latore this year. What can you say about that young man and his versatility? Because he's come on leaps and bounds this year as well. He has. And you know what? He's a story of why the league exists because he was a local lad that was playing for Calgary Northside and then went to Foothills. And, you know, my brother and, and Leon Apgood were always in my ear about him, just a very, very technical footballer. And we took him as a 17 year old with our 2019 squad. And unfortunately for Victor, we had a hell of a 2019 year. I think we only lost four games and obviously won the spring and the fall and got to final and the Whitecaps journey. So, he was then behind Elijah Adekubi, very similar profile player. You, you know, Julian Boucher was one of the best midfielders in the league that year. Mm -hmm. Nick Ledgerwood, who you know, obviously uh, Nick speaks for himself. Mauro Astakio. And Mauro, if he'd have kept fit, you know, you look at what his brother's doing now. They're very similar in profiles as well. So he was behind that group of players. So he learned from that. And I think you know, it was one of, it was my brother who said it to him. He said, if you think of Phil Foden now, who was he behind? He was behind David Silva. And he didn't play a lot, you know, two or three years ago. And now he's at, he's flourishing. And, and Jay used to talk to him about that, is just be patient. So we didn't take him on 2020 um, because we felt we needed to get him into university and then COVID it. So he missed out a year. This year, he survived and thrived. And sometimes you just need that as a player. You need that little bit of luck, opportunity. You know, Elijah's injury, unfortunately, you know, but... He's the one now that's that's been the mainstay in our team. He's very, very technical. He's learning the game all the time. You know, we're trying to teach him it's what you do in position, out of possession, that's going to be the difference maker because he's a baller when it comes to it. He's sticky. He's slippery. He can pass right or left foot. He's very aggressive when he needs to press or, or tackle. He's got a great range of pass and he can add to goals. But it's what he does out of in position, out of possession that we're continuing to teach him because mm. the game is so fluent tactically now. Yeah. Yeah. Victor is, does certainly impress us a lot, especially when you guys have had injuries to Elliot Simmons or Nick mm. Ledgerwood. He's, he seems to like, he's always been there. Yeah. It's been, been fascinating. I know, uh, I know we are kind of running out of time a little bit here. So maybe just to bring it back to this playoff game against Pacific, how excited are you guys for this game? I know you've had this week of or this week ish since Tuesday of training. And just what what do you guys need to see in this game to beat Pacific? I think we just need to show up. I honestly I don't see much changing in terms of how both sides of play. They might have a couple of rollout nuances that we'll have to get into. Um, but I think for for us is just doing what we do best. I think at times Coaches can overcoach. I think sometimes we've learned we've got to get out of the player's way and make the big thing the big thing where the big thing is about, you know, your matchups on the team, their tendencies that can change. And we use our saying all the time, adapt and overcome. We've got to have the ability to adapt to a change in formation from them, a change in personnel, you know, going up a goal or down a goal. It's that's what's going to have to be what we do. And we've got the guys training in, the, in a way that everything's habitual. So it's now taking the pressure off them and just allowing them to play freely because they're quality players. And, and we, we know that. So we know what we've got. We just got to keep just encouraging them to do their thing. Tons of foot soldiers in the comments. They can't wait to get there. They're given. Uh, we had Manny Aparicio on before. I, I was kind because I didn't throw any comments towards him, but they were giving him a lot of grief in the comments. So you may have read them, but we weren't going to give them out there. But they were. They were already given the home field advantage even on on our, on our on our show here, Tommy. So I'm, I'm sure they'll be there. And um, I'm looking forward to being drowned out on our interviews with you on Saturday by those because they make some noise out there. So you're going to look forward to that home Do you advantage. Know they're superb. You know, you've you've experienced it. They make our, our experience just that much different. And because it's, you know, they hang over the stadium. It's a bit like a Roman Coliseum and getting the smoke flares and they get the banter going and they are terrific. It's an intimidating place to come because of them. And what's neat now is, you know, after Kyle Lahren scores his goals, he goes and grabs a drum. And whose drum was it? It was the foot soldiers drum. So there's yeah. kind of they're becoming part of this Canadian supporters folklore. Really special indeed. Great to see them there on Tuesday night as well. Uh, great to see you here on Thursday night. Tommy Wilden Jr., the main man in Cavalry. Good luck on Saturday. We'll see you out there. Uh, you deserve this. A home playoff game. We all know where we've been, right? COVID, bubbles, playing on islands, not playing at home, not playing at home for months. You get to play at home in front of your home supporters. It doesn't get much better than that. Enjoy it, Tommy. Thanks for this. Thanks for having us. Appreciate your work, guys. 
always appreciate yours as well. The best man himself, indeed, Tommy Wilden Jr. What a great inspiration he is. A uh, true pleasure to talk to and always learn things from football from him. And we'll find out, Charlie, whether that, that board behind there, indeed, 3-4-3. I just yep. saw Dan Klopp moving already on the board, I think. He was already just <laughs> doing it himself, just moving behind there as, as he goes back to four and three. Uh, that is our preview of Pacific at Cavalry on Saturday. Uh, joined now by uh, talking to the top fellas. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this guy as well. Here he is himself, uh, Kwame Uwua from Forge FC uh, on the show. Uh, we go from a great man to another great man. Kwame, great to see you. How's it going? It's going good, going good. Finally, about time I got to chat with you guys. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, we, we've been wanting you on for a while, man. Mm-hmm. So this is great to have you on. How much are you looking forward to this uh, on Saturday, on, on Sunday? And uh, also, before we get into that, you can talk about that as well. What's this week been like for you guys? Obviously, you played at home on the week uh, against Tommy Wilden's Cavalry, but Canada on Tuesday night. What was that like for you as well? I mean, yeah, we our game was obviously first on the one soccer uh, headliner, but honestly, watching some of the guys that I used to play with, I grew up with, one of my best friends, Richie Larea, playing at one of the highest levels against apparently one of the best teams in CONCACAF. I think Canada's better at this point, but that's neither here or there. But um, just seeing these guys that I grew up with playing at the highest level, it's, it's, it's inspiring. I mean, they did it on a cold, cold ice tundra pitch in Edmonton, and those guys never backed down. Every game they played, they've never backed down. And you can see after the game, yeah, there's a little scuffle, but I think that is the identity of the team. Everybody grinds them, grinds and from the trenches, and they're just working. And I think that's the most important thing. And it trickles back to every level of the game, right? I mean, even for for guys in the CPL, right? If you see millions of people watching the Canadian national team and they even if it's their first time playing that's you know that's good for us and it's good for yourself right yeah exactly it was fun to watch really fun to watch just seeing the guys the way they celebrated you could tell it meant a lot to everyone in Canada and a lot to the guys on the team Kwame, I saw you in Edmonton, and that talk about cold. That was cold, by the way. You were running up and down on the side of the pitch, and you were getting ready and to come on. In the end, you had to come on with an injury. But uh, on Saturday at FC Edmonton, what's this time been like for you uh, physically and mentally? Because I know players just love to play, but your team, more than any other team in Canada in professional soccer, has been tested with the amount of games that you played. You're playing a game of every, average almost every four days. You've been to so many different co- countries, You know, obviously in the CONCACAF world as well. You've topped the table. What's this past four or five months been like for you in this group? I mean, I think it all starts from last year. The pandemic showed us that like soccer can be taken away from you just like that, right? And a lot of us are in the prime of our careers or just starting our prime of our careers. And for the pandemic, for for that to happen and then not knowing that the uncertainty of this year and how it was going to go, just being able to play soccer in general, I think a lot of guys are not taking it for granted. I mean, for me especially, I think the most important thing is like when we got back to training, I was like, honestly, I don't care where, when, how, as long as I'm playing, that's the most important thing because I realize how quickly everything can be taken away from us. And yeah, it's mentally and physically draining. And Bobby, if you guys know him, he demands a lot from us and he does his best to rotate the team. But obviously as a player, you want to play as much as possible. And every three days, I mean, it's a game. So we enjoy it. We enjoy it as much as possible. I mean, sometimes training can get a little um, less intense, obviously because of the games, but I think it's important how we switch on when the game the game comes. And the last four months has been definitely a tough one. And I think these four or five months we will be able to have maximum, if we go to final Conquer Cat League and final CPU, I think it's 40 something, 40 something games in four months. So 40 10, or 41, yeah. Yeah, four, yeah. Four, four, 10 games a month. And I mean, we. <laughs> it's not like we don't have little complaints, but like it, it is what it is at this point, right? And it's, it's, it's for the good of everyone's career and everyone's uh profile right exactly yeah it's certainly a lot of games especially considering you only started at the end of june (laughs) so yeah i i I just say july 1st for people that yeah (laughs) that aren't paying attention right (laughs) exactly um you know you, you mentioned you just during the pandemic especially you just wanted to play not only are you guys playing right now you're playing some massive games yeah, I Forge have played more huge games than any CPL club this year, right? With with CONCACAF and the Canadian Championship. But now we're going into this playoff game on Sunday against York. You're at home. What is the preparation like for you guys? You've seen so many elimination games before, but what is it like for you guys as players and as a club leading into these big games? I mean, 
I give credit to Fort. I mean, I give credit to York because they come to Tim Hortons Field and they've stolen two games away from us. Uh, one where they got a guy sent off and we dominated the game but couldn't find the back of the net. And the other where they just caught us on the counter multiple times and were able to f- finish and we couldn't finish our chances as well. But yeah, York is a York is a good team. Semifinals important. And I think the most important thing is that, yeah, we finished in first, but now that doesn't matter. We got our home field advantage and yeah, it's good, but at the end of the day, everything starts fresh. So it's a one-off game. Anything can happen. I think the most important thing is just concentration and intensity, being able to know, like, okay, guys, luckily we have that um, experience in knockout games, but I think it's still going to be a tough game. York is not an easy easy opponent. We wouldn't expect you to downplay them any minute at all anyway, but you talk about the experience there. You know, big games this year, but big games throughout. You know, this this team for Forge over the last few years with the similar players. You know, what's that like when you know and you look to your left or you look so you look to your right and you've got Crutzen there or Samuel there and you go Ashley Janssen's there and Becker's in front of you. These guys that you've been through the trenches with, uh, for, you know, for multiple years now. What's that like in that moment and a five minute moment where the other team's on top of you and how how big can that help you get through those moments in games? Yeah, I mean, a lot A lot of it has to do with uh, leadership and just how we connect within the, the locker room. A lot of us, we all get along together. A lot of us play uh, Sigma Academy together and then obviously excluding like the international guys, but we've all come from the same kind of footballing system, the same kind of uh, places. We've all known each other for a long time. And I think we know that we have to depend on each other to get things done. So everybody does their job well and no one tries to do each other's job and I think it's just trust and we just work hard. And that's the that's what comes down to it. If we work hard as harder or as hard as the other team, I think our football supersedes everything else. Absolutely. I mean, I I just wondering, I, I want to think back to 2019 when you guys came together. I know a lot of you knew each other from Sigma and whatnot, but when you came together as this team, did you ever have any idea that you guys would three years later have won two championships, you're going to the playoffs again, you've qualified for the Champions League. Did, uh, even now, do you ever think back at just kind of what's happened in these last three years for your club? Yeah, I give credit to, obviously, like the general manager, uh, Costa, um, Bob Young. It's You can see every year we've gotten, we've gotten better, we've gotten more comfortable with each other. I think in the beginning, 2019, we all got into the, the season with a kind of an ego, knowing the players that we had. We're like, okay, this – we downplayed the competition and you can see how we started off 2019, right? And I think once we got, we focused more on ourselves and got down to what we needed to do, um, you seen us win the first, the forever first one. And then you seen us play against big teams like Antigua and then be uh, Olympia, story of historic franchise in Olympia. And then obviously pushing to, 2020, the pandemic and everything hits. And I think obviously the mentality switch, everybody's just like, <laughs> as long as I get certain amount of games, we only played what 14, 15 games that year. And just to play those games and end up playing, beating teams like Taro and stuff like that, like it was amazing because we didn't have a preseason. We didn't have much of a league compared to those other guys. So I think barely or missing any home games or any home games and then barely yeah. missing the Champions League in a penalty shootout against the Haitian team last year. So I think guys were just hungry every year. We just wanted more. And the CONCACAF, I think the CONCACAF games were must uh, like more of a motivation and we brought the same energy to the league. You mentioned CONCACAF there. The draw has been announced on to be December 15th for next year's CONCACAF Champions League. And, and anyone who's watching may not know this. You are in it and you're in the last 16. Um, you will be in pot two. Do you have a preference who you want to get? Cruz Azul, Club Leon, Pumas, uh, Colorado Rapids, New England Revolution, the Sounders, or whoever wins MLS Cup. Like, do you, Where do you want to go, man? Do you have a preference or what? I mean, no, because I think we've been everywhere in Central America anyway, so it doesn't matter if we go to Mexico again. Um, <laughs> That's a great point. You, this yeah. is about places they're sending you right now. The rest yeah. of it is going to feel luxurious, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like – being able to play anywhere in Mexico, the the fan base. I mean, playing. Imagine us playing at the Azteca for our first Champions League game oh, yeah. ever. Like that'd That's be right. that'd be that'd be amazing. I feel like guys, even guys on our team are talking about it. Like that'd be a great experience. I mean, playing against Colorado Raptors, New England Revolution. I have a couple of friends that play on those teams as well. So that'd be that'd be refreshing. You can see how we go up against other MLS sides, not just the Canadian ones. Like we played against Montreal. Um, but yeah, I don't think it really matters. I think guys will be up for it. And I think the most important thing is that 
we've, we're focusing on ourselves. I mean, we beat Olympia, who's beaten Montreal, who's beaten teams in CONCAP Champions League, we've beaten Taro, who's beaten FC Dallas and stuff like that. So I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yeah, it's going to be a tough competition, but just getting there, obviously, in the three years that we've been a, a team, yeah, that's an amazing feat. I mean, you guys yourselves nearly beat Montreal, right? Exactly. This doesn't get any closer than the way you almost beat Montreal, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Tristan Let Henry having to just take a goal, get, get, get up and take a penalty. Yeah, you told me you're the one that told him he had to take a penalty. I was the one. <laughs> he had no idea. <laughs> Poor guy. I mean, it's just, he, he saves, you know, penalty, t- the 10th penalty he goes in. He's like, how many more of these? And he looks at me, I'm like, He's walking away. He's like, no, no, you got to take one now. He's like, he's like, he's just like, oh, I've never seen the poor guy just lose his mind in a second. The poor guy. I'm like, just I, I, at that moment, I'm like, I, and someone said to me, how did he not know? And I'm like, would you know if you no. if your job was to just make penalty yeah. saves? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you're not counting. You're just like, yeah. can you guys just please score for me? Get out of <laughs> yeah, I, feel, I don't know. I think that's a debate that we were having. Like, I don't know, if goalkeeper should take penalties. No, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also don't know what happens after that. It start Something restarts is, again. Oh, again. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. still do or die. Yeah, wow. it still, still keeps going. Um, <laughs> hey, you never know. If, if you practice your penalties this week, it could go with penalties again. I mean, hopefully it, don't have to, it doesn't have to go that far. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can get the job done um, on Sunday and then go to our third CPL final. That, that would be pretty special. Hey, we'll wrap that up on that one. What would it mean to you to go out there? On, and I know you've had some big games already this season, but to go out there and, and, and clinch a spot in the final, which would be at Tim Hortons Field as well, is that a big carrot for you guys, knowing that you don't have to go anywhere? What would it mean for you to get that win on Sunday and get to, get to a final to be played in your own stadium after all that we've been through in the world in the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, just remembering how it was in the 2019 final, the energy, obviously, us in Calgary had a bit of a... <laughs> uh, beef going on, but it brought the intensity a lot, a, a lot, a lot up in the game. And I think that just having being able to host a final at Tim Hortons Field, uh, it means a lot to the fans. And the fans have been with us through thick and thin, through the coldest weathers. And I think we deserve it. They deserve it. And hopefully, we can get it done. You do deserve it, no doubt about it. Uh, one of the best players in our league this year, undoubtedly, I think we'll be up there for one of those contending M- MVP awards as well. Um, so we'll give you a shout out for that, Kwame. Uh, um, right, I think probably the, easy to say the two best left backs in the league going toe to toe on Sunday with Dini Nabzi so. and Kwame. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, Kwame, we can't thank you enough to have you on the show. It's been a thank pleasure, man. We'll get you on again in the future. Anytime. Good luck anytime. on Sunday, okay? Thank Absolutely. you. Appreciate you guys. No, have we appreciate one. you. Have a great one as well. The Kwame, uh, uh, who I saw, uh, as I said, in Edmonton. I also saw him the last time at York Line Stadium, the, the weekend game, uh, when he was playing in midfield. Um, yep. and, and he came back from be- behind. You were there as well, Charlie. But uh, that has been a close start, the, the close rivalry. You know, as I said earlier, this one versus four, it's going to be all set up for one to go out there and win it, and they should win it. Um, but our next guest is going to have something to say about that as well. <laughs> uh, let's get him in right here. President, CEO, and, G- and GM of York United, Mr. Angus McNabb. Uh, Gus, good to see you, my friend. Thanks for joining the show. Fourth and final guest. The save the best for last. <laughs> no, thanks very much. I've got the uh, the graveyard slot with you boys, so I see if people are still there. <laughs> oh, lots of people still here. I had lots of t- tons of people with the chat as well. But yeah. we've started every guest this week because we're all connected to kind of Canada soccer with what did Tuesday night mean to you? So I'll ask you the same thing. It it was just phenomenal to watch it. I mean, you you look at where we are as a league, the ambition. And I think as well, if you look at it from someone outside coming into it, you've got a player on the bench there who his first steps and his sort of formative time in in sort of professional soccer um, was on loan at Valor in year one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you see what that's doing already. And so by hopefully a World Cup next year, there's more CPL participation in that Canada squad. And we're providing a, a real solid and meaningful piece in the Canadian soccer puzzle. So just phenomenal on, on so many levels. Um, just great to see and um, possibly the greatest celebration that I've seen in a, <laughs> certainly in a, in a while as well. It was just awesome. Uh, and just yeah. everyone enjoying things in that stadium. Absolutely. That, uh, that Valor player, for anybody who doesn't know, being James Pentemis, by the way. Uh, it all it all trickles down, right? It all comes back. Everything in Canadian soccer. I know there's a lot coming. The CPL will probably end up being more involved with 
these national teams. I think there's a under 20 championship next summer, which Angus, I know your club is, is probably eyeing with some interest because yeah. you've got some great young players, but just, it, it really is. It, it just the game as a whole in the country, the national team winning helps everything, right? Yeah, it does. And um, I think it, th- there's going to be trickle down, as we sort of said there, in terms of MLS clubs and players loaning and getting opportunity. Um, that's, the, that's the huge piece in this, whether it's sort of trickle down and MLS clubs and an opportunity that way for players, as it has been, but also bottom up as well and sort of mm-hmm. building this and mm-hmm. building the pyramid. Um, it's going to go both ways over the next number of years in this country. Um, and ultimately you look at it these sort of uh, people that have funded these teams and eight teams across the country that's sort of eight by 23 you've got that many new soccer jobs in this country just on the playing side and the coaching side and everything else Um, and that is growing year upon year upon year and we look with expansion and what we have to do with expansion as a league and growing the talent pool um, as well because just filling eight rosters now um, it, it's, it's fine, there's no problem as a task um, we have plenty players out there that are there putting their hand up within Canada guys mm-hmm. coming from overseas to come back home because we now exist as a competition as well um, but also building bottom up um, and giving players opportunity um, and our philosophy as a club getting the Lowell Wrights guys like that into an environment as teenagers um, and giving them opportunity to uh, show what they can do. And also, as we were talking earlier about the pathway, right? We were talking earlier in the show about the U Sports National Championships as well, and that what development that can be and get players from there as well. Um, Angus runs a club in real life. If you want to run a club on the game, a reminder, stick around. Before the end of the show, we are giving away uh, Football Manager 2022 to one lucky fan or what viewer. So stick around. We're going to ask you a question later. And you can go on and be York United. You can be Angus McNabb on the game <laughs> and run York United and take them to the title. Uh, something that Angus is hoping to do this week uh, as he starts the quest to try and lift that trophy at the end of the year, uh, the Shield, as you go to Hamilton. Uh, talk us about that, uh, Angus. What has it been like for you watching your young soldiers come through this because they are such a young group, the youngest group. We all know what your emphasis is as a club and you must be proud of the, these young players and the old ones. We'll get to some of those as well as the tour has been an immense for you. Uh, just guiding yourself into this top four and especially this for your club on Sunday. Yeah, it's massive and it's it's been an evolution for the guys from what we had. Uh, and it seems a lifetime ago, like the preseason or, or lack of preseason um, that the guys faced and having probably the best part of 12 days of training um, before first kick of a ball in Winnipeg. Um, and so I think we had a moment at the very end of that bubble in Winnipeg where if we don't beat Edmonton, that's a swing from seventh to fifth. Um, and that sort of game there just gives the guys that little bit that we're knocking on the door. We're nearly there. Um, they took a lot from that. The sort of home opener back in stadium um, was another sort of real gut check for them as well with Zats getting the red card, which was obviously wiped out um, on review and things there. But then coming back and going to Tim Hortons Field and getting the win um, and going down there to the team that are the champions that are doing well in CONCACAF um, and getting wins at their place. So the sort of York Forge rivalry, I think, um, yeah, I'll be honest, it, it was very Canadian. It was very nice. We were neighbours rather than rivals. Um, and I think that's great now this weekend. Um, it really matters. It's knockout football. They're CPL's knockout kings. So what better? Go down there and try and knock them off their pedestal a bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys have obviously seen a lot of Forge this year. Um, I think I think you were about even until those last two games of the season where they, they took those ones. But you York United are the only team, I think, in 2021 to go to Tim Hortons Field and win. You've done it twice. Or I, I guess Cavalry did just a few days ago. So that ruined my stat. But not in the same season. Not <laughs> yeah, just one. Not in the yeah. So you guys have won twice there, but there has to be just this incredible excitement around this group because you were close to making the playoffs or the final four at the Island games last year, but you're in this time. You've got a shot at this trophy. There's got to be an incredible excitement around this group right now. I think there's excitement generally because it's young players um, yeah. and it's people that are forging 
like the, the first steps in their careers in terms of this is their journey um, and they're writing it and, and they're really enjoying writing it together. Um, they are a really, really good group of lads, um, first and foremost. I think the balance of, of fun and work that they have, they all enjoy each other's company. Um, I think we've done some things right just as a club generally in how we treat the guys, where we put them in housing and getting more of them together in sort of the same condo building um, so that there's that connectivity between them and, and sort of it's really built. Um, and that's gone very, very well for them. Um, they all like spending time with each other and just grabbing a coffee after training, sort of doing these things. And that's great when you've got a young squad to build that connectivity because when it genuinely matters, they care. They want to put it in for their mate and they're the guy who's next to them. And so that is something that, yeah, very, very proud of the way that not only that they are that way and what they've developed, but, but actually the way they carry themselves. They're really, really good young men um, in terms of within that squad and very, very impressive with it as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's a group we're very proud of. Um, and we really, really, I think we're going to relish the opportunity. Um, I think these last couple of games against Forge, um, not gone our way results wise, but I think also it's, um, yeah, that proper rivalry um, is starting to build. Like you chat to the boys and there is a bit of, uh, there's a bit of mouth going on between them already. That's what we want. So, yes. Yeah, it is. Like yeah. genuinely it is like they, you want that competitive tension um, because ultimately at the end of the day, we try to take something off them that they've got. So it's, it's perfect. It's what sport's all about. Um, so hopefully we'll nip down the, down the motorway, as we call it, to the big coffee pot and take the win. Love it. Big coffee pot. Lots of love for Angus and York in the chat. Albert uh, says loves, loves Angus. Pepsi man as well. And Phil says, Angus, how many of us will be in the away supporters section at Tim Hortons? What's the plan? And uh, obviously tickets, I'm sure, still available for York fans to join the party if they want. Yeah, they are. The, uh, the guys, so the centre of the universe and the Northern Corridor supporters clubs have been great additions to the experience at the stadium for us this year and on the road as well. Um, guys sort of traveling. Yeah. I met them in Ottawa. Ottawa. They were great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, up in Ottawa and like up in Halifax as well. I think a few made it to as well. So um, our fans there have been awesome. Uh, they have got uh, the, the bus heading down on Sunday. Uh, I think they're uh, meeting up at a bar pretty close to, to Tim Horton's field beforehand. And then sort of, uh, all wandering across together for the game. So uh, we're hoping there'll be a, a decent amount in the stand. And also as well, I think the, uh, I've got to give a big shout out to the Johnson family, to Isaiah's mum and dad <laughs> and everyone who have just been awesome all year as well. Um, and I think that they will definitely be there on mass as well as, as well as a lot of others. I think, um, again, the, the other bit of the club, I think some of that stuff and yeah, I'll single Isaiah out in it. The young sort of, a young guy who yeah. is still in his teenage years, um, he's showing outstanding leadership qualities. And so rewarding him with a new deal is a very easy and very pleasing thing to do when yeah. you have something off field where he is perceptive enough and realizes that for Canadian Thanksgiving, you've got a lot of guys who are away from family, not there, any of that stuff. And he puts together sort of dinner for 16, 17 of them with his mum and dad. Um, and look, Amazing. it is. And that's a young guy stepping up and just realising the situation others are around him in and how he could play a part and help. And um, that that's an ex a man of exceptional character. Um, and I think you see that um, when he's on the pitch. Like, I think you could, little moments through the year when uh, I think in the cavalry game, um, him having a little bit of a niggle with uh, Nick Ledgerwood and things there. And he, he's, there is something special about this group and their desire to put it in for each other. And it's little moments like that that foster it and, and really, really build this. Um, so we're, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Very excited. And uh, another, I us hope for another twist and turn in what's been a great <laughs> season. It seems crazy that, yes, Canada and everything that went on Tuesday night, but that's also the end of the, the CPL regular season on Tuesday night. And uh, it's, it's been pretty wild and it's been pretty intense. And um, 
from my standpoint, with our playing group, and I'm sure everyone else cross country, we thank the players for everything that they've put in, in this as well. And our coaching staff, our front offices around the league, um, because to get us to this point this year, people forget that we had sort of 10, 12 days notice from the bubble to home openers. And people have moved mountains to get things going this season um, in clubs around the country. Um, and our staff have been a massive part of that as well. Brilliant stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Absolutely. Uh, Angus, let me ask you this quickly before we let you go. You're so connected and you've got so many contacts by, you know, did you but from back home with the UK, but also in MLS as well. And, and now, as people have said here in the chat, someone called you a proper soccer guy uh, or football, whichever your preference. Um, but my, well, my point being is that when you take a phone call, I'm sure it happens to you at least once a month from one of these countries, and they ask you about this league for the first time, what do you tell them? What do you say right away? Is it the growth? Is it the quality on the pitch? Is it everything? Is it the country? What, what, do, you, what do you talk to them about? So, first of all, they, they can't believe when you actually speak about it and you look at the facts. They, they just go, hang on, that's mad. So, below the MLS, there was nothing. Um, <laughs> and you just go, yeah, genuinely, a country Canada's size, an economic power like that, th there was nothing until this was here. And so, their mind's blown a little bit like that. Then you start to have conversations of things like um, the international recruitment strategy um, and people that are doing things differently. Um, you start to have conversations about something like our squad and they've had a look on transfer market and they see our average squad age. Um, and there's a lot of, I can't believe you guys are getting to do this and do it properly with a blank sheet of paper and what other countries in the world would give to sort of rewrite history and start with a blank slate and truly innovate and truly try and build something um, that is uh, future-proofed. So that's right down to one soccer and the creation of a league that is direct to consumer from the very beginning. And it's really important that we're getting carriage on cable and everything like that. We're getting in more homes. But what we've built genuinely is what a lot of leagues around the world are aspiring to mm. and launching their own OTT services and launching sort of premium models over the top of it. We've really been at the forefront of that and what we're doing, what we're collecting, all, all of these things. It's a really interesting narrative and story, but it's not a story. It's a working example. Like we, we've got people in CPL HQ, in the clubs, our players, we are truly living this and doing it. Um, and then I think, the top down piece in that you've got to give a lot of credit to men's national team, but women's national team as well. We're going yeah. to go through a period here where we hope that we've got another three years um, with the women's Olympic gold medalist. And we've got a world cup coming up where what happened in the last major tournament, well, we won it. It's ours in terms of yeah. says, come and chase us. Yeah. And so these moments in the country and getting behind it, um, are just absolutely massive. So when you speak to anyone, they're, they're genuinely like, this isn't like on the rise. Um, it's come, it's now, and it's, it's how are we going to stay there and how are we going to sustain this? Um, and not just to sustain it, exceed it and go further um, because that's the potential. It's absolutely massive. Um, so, yeah, it's great. It's a lot of fun. And... Um, feel very privileged to be involved with the project as I know you, both of you guys do as well. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Mate. It's great to hear the passion in your voice because I know how much you have it. We all are very privileged and honored to do it and push our own, uh, you know, push our own work towards what, what is a wonderful league. You know, I signed someone today. I, I genuinely love the Canadian Premier League. You know, I, I genuinely love it, you know, and I want to push it forward. Um, I guess we'll wrap up on this. What would winning Sunday mean to you? Uh, a plane somewhere for the following, a plane out west. Um, <laughs> a plane out west and uh, Alex, our team manager, probably ringing me frantically going, right, I've got to hold this many flights. Who's going? Who's not going? And everything there. So, um, But it, it would mean a lot for me personally, but I think it would be uh, deserved for the players in that squad and what they've put in this year. Yeah. Um, and it would be a, a fitting next step in a lot of their careers. Um, because we are a next step in terms of for, for a lot of the guys on this team. And um, I firmly expect to be taking f phone calls, regardless of Sunday's result, um, from some of these people that I know around the world inquiring about some of the players 
on our side, but also on other sides across the league because um, the, the talent here and the evolution of the game this year and, and the quality that we've seen on pitch, um, it, it's nudging up again and again and again. And I actually think with the fixture congestion and what guys have done over the, the back end of the season, um, the quality is going up. Um, it truly is. And, and that's great to see. And I think we've got four fitting semi-finalists um, based on the year. We're happy to have uh, got in there. And uh, now it's on the boys to take opportunity. Um, and it's great when it's uh, ultimately placed in your hands and uh, you just got to go out there and go for it. Yeah, well said. I completely agree. And I know Charlie and I have spoke about that yeah. a lot on our podcast. The quality continues to go up and the schedule has been a major test. The players, as you alluded to, deserve all the great, you know, over all the gratitude we've got for them, right? What a wonderful year we've had with them as well. Um, listen, mate, this has been a pleasure. Thanks for spending some time with us talking about your club and obviously being in the semi final, previewing it. Keep up the fantastic work. We're better as a, as a country having you involved in it as well. And we'll see you on Sunday. Much appreciated. Cheers, guys. Catch you That's soon. That's great. Thanks. The great Angus McNabb himself, uh, obviously president, CEO, GM of York United. All right, quiz time. Uh, I want a question right. out there. Let's get a question out there. Actually, I'm coming up with that on the fly. So I want <laughs> two players, two players' names. First person to write both players' names in the chat. No other players in the chat will win Football Manager 2022. Here is the quiz. Um, who was the first Pacific player to score against Cavalry this year? And who was the last cavalry player to score against Pacific? There you go. I'll do that again. Who was the last cavalry player to Whoa. score against Pacific? We gave you the answer on the quiz. And who was the first Pacific player to score against cavalry this year? Two players. Type them in there. All we need It's two players. We gave you one of the answers on the quiz. Uh, and you can only write two players in there. The first one in there will be... Uh, Pepsi Man, you're wrong. It's not bro. I just got into the CPL. Uh, <laughs> uh, just Let's just see if anyone can come up with this. <laughs> Uh, let's throw some guesses in there and uh, let's see whether you do. We just gave you the answer on the show. Uh, who was the last Cavalry player to score against Pacific? Pacific. Tommy, Tommy Wielden Jr. told you. It was just in the last game. So let's see whether we can get any answers in here as well. And uh, and post it in the chat and see if we can get, get rid of for Football Manager 2022. And you could be Angus McNabb uh, yourself. Uh, are you a Football Manager player, Charlie? Uh, I've tried to be. I'm yeah. not very good at it. I, no. There's a lot <laughs> of layers honest. in it. No, I'm, I can't yeah, say I've played it for, for a long time. Very, so. very complicated. It's actually impressive how complicated is it is. Is it I think, really? I think like there's there are professional coaches at very high levels on record being like, I've I've played the game and it's scarily accurate. Interesting. About what it's like to to be a manager at a football club. I think everybody is uh, Googling at the moment. Oh, are they? So okay, well, might, let's yeah. just go. Let's go with this then. It was the last player to score in the game between Cavalry and Pacific. One player. Let's go with that. One player. That's all we need. <laughs> uh, just put it. Put, just put the answer in at the bottom there. The last player to score against them. Uh, oh. And uh, it wasn't... We've got uh, two guesses here. Yeah, no, just, uh, yeah, there you go. Conrad, Joe Mason, you're the winner. Conrad, you're the winner of Football Manager 2022. Uh, congratulations to you. Uh, you have won. Uh, Joe Mason uh, is the winner. Uh, Conrad, well done. You will get Football Manager 2022. Here is what you need to do. You just need to DM uh, Campia, uh, Canadian Premier League on website uh, on Twitter. I think that's where we're going to do it. Yeah. I uh, just did yeah. just uh, d just go on Twitter and you can send them a DM. Thankfully, Conrad has put his real name on there, so we know that you are the winner of that as well. Uh, and then, yeah, there you go. DM Canadian Premier League on Twitter. Uh, Charlie, this has been a pleasure, man. Thanks for sticking around with everyone. I know it's a long show, but it's a massive week for Canadian That's soccer. Um, if you missed this show, you can go back and watch it anytime or listen to it on our Canadian Premier League Newsroom podcast. Uh, we can't thank enough the great guests. Obviously, Angus McNabb and Kwame Wood. Their game is Sunday, the second uh, game of the day and of the weekend in the Canadian Premier League. But on Sunday, Canadian Championship, TFC are in Montreal. CF Montreal against CFC for a Canadian Championship at 1 o'clock live on One Soccer, followed by, in Hamilton, Forge against York United, Seed 1 versus Seed 4. And on Saturday, the big game of the day will be at, at Cofield in Calgary as Cavalry, Seeded 2, take on the third seed, Pacific FC. Tommy Wielden Jr., can't thank him enough for coming in as well. And Manny Aparicio, the midfielder for our Palmer Cars team, Pacific FC. Charlie, looking forward to this one. Should be good. Absolutely.
It's going to yeah. be great. <laughs> Cannot wait. Looking forward to this. And as usual, Charlie, Benedict, Marty, and myself, all the action will be on campiel.ca. You can catch a lot of things there. And a reminder, games live on One Soccer. Where else would they be this weekend? All right, we'll chat with you again soon. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good week. Enjoy the games. God bless. Take care.